It's good to have everyone here. It's good to be here myself as well. So I'm going to get to know hopefully most of you or all of you if I don't know you already. But uh, you have been prayed for and we're asking the Lord to do something that uh, is beyond our ability on our own to do. But it's not outside of our responsibility to work with him in this. And it's something that where he would open our eyes and give us the ability to do something that is really impossible, and that's called trust him. It's an impossible thing to trust someone who you can't see, right? You can't see God, right? But you're called to trust him. And uh, so if you're with me, I believe that is a big part of why we struggle in obeying and doing what's right. We don't trust that there's good coming on the other side of where we're at right now. We don't trust that there's someone in control of where we're going, that, and it's good if we follow him. So we're going to build what we do up on the scripture, and so I'm going to ask us to right now just ask God to give us this ability to trust him. And I hope that through this whole series that you're saying, Lord, teach me to trust you. Give me the ability to trust you. Uh, and the scripture is going to fill that ability to, with information. So let's pray together, okay? Father, I thank you for those who are here. I pray that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened, that we might come to know the hope of our calling, might come to know the inheritance that's ours, that we might come to believe in the power that's at work in us. Father, I pray that we might be able to comprehend your love, that your spirit might open our eyes to that so that we might in this present generation trust you in what's going on right now in 2019 in our lives. There's, a, there's many adversities, many struggles, but Father, we ask you to teach us to do good in these things, to persevere in doing what's right, but we can only do that if we trust that there's something good through the doing of right. Otherwise, why don't we just do what we feel? If there's no good coming, then let's just do what we want right now. But we wait on you in perseverance. and We ask your Holy Spirit to teach us to trust you, to give us that ability. Father, we desire, we use the word healing a lot, we desire to be healed, but really we understand that healing only is what we're talking about is resolving the anxiety, resolving the fear, resolving the anger in us, resolving the revenge in us, resolving the angst in us. And that only can come as we trust you for something better. And so, Lord, would you teach us how to do that? Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So you have an outline there and uh, scripture says we're to trust in the Lord with what? All our heart. Well, let's begin to try to do that. And my question tonight is, do we even try to do that? Does that even come on our radar that we should be trusting in the Lord with all our heart? Right? What is easier to do, to trust God or obey Him? It's easier to obey a list, isn't it? It's easier to say, okay, God, you want me to walk over there and say to that person, hey, God loves you. <laughs> I can do that. But can I trust you that if my enemy is hurting me, that I should go over there and do good because I trust that you're going to reward me according to my faith? Right? Can I trust you? That's harder. It's harder to do. And this outline here you have... I'm going to move over here just a second. This is what you have in your outline. Um, adversity and its accompanying... Whoops, hold on just a second. Adversity and its accompanying emotional pain comes in many forms. So the question naturally arises, where is God in all of this? Can you really trust God when adversity strikes and fills your life with pain? Does he indeed come to the rescue of those who seek him? Does he, as the text at the beginning of this chapter affirms, deliver those who call upon him in the day of trouble? 
Does the Lord's unfailing love surround the person who trusts in Him? Can you trust God? The question itself has two possible meanings before we attempt to answer it. Can you trust God? Meaning, is He dependable in times of adversity? Can you rely upon Him? But the second meaning is also critical. Can you trust God? Do you have such a relationship with God and such a confidence in Him that you believe that He's with you in your adversity even though you don't see any evidence of His presence or His power? Do you trust God? Um, so, let me get to my other part here. I want us to right now do what uh, I've told others to do at the beginning of learning to trust God, and that's I want us to create a worry list. <laughs> Does that sound like a fun thing to do right now? Not really, right? But I want you to take uh, and on the back side of your outline, do you have a blank piece of paper there on the back side? Wherever you want to, it could be the very back, but you want to go to this place at different times. I want you to write down the things that you have to be worried about and don't make them the small things, you know. I want to know, in other words, you're not going to share these with me necessarily, but what are you worried about? What, what are you worried about? I'm worried about my older son Isaac and his career. I'm not, why should I be worried? My wife back there would say, you have nothing to worry about with him. He's doing great. Oh, I can find things to worry about. <laughs> what are you worried about? I'm wor maybe you're worried about a relationship. Maybe you're worried about your health. Um, and to help prime the pump so that everyone is very practical as you guys are writing, would anyone care to share something that a person could be worried about? And we won't believe it's you if you share it with us. Financial. Financial worry. Yeah, like what? Worried that... Um, if you got laid off. Laid off, you might get laid off. Or if you did get laid off, getting another job. Yes. Pay the bills. That's right. So fear of being laid off from your employer. And then what would you do to pay the bills? And what's so bad about not being able to pay the bills? <laughs> you get evicted. You could get evicted, yeah. Off. Yeah, your children may not be able to accomplish things you'd like, or you, you yourself might maybe lose your car, lose your house, lose a relationship, right? All those things. Worried. Yes? I'm worried about my son who was very traumatized, and now he is very angry. Yeah, so worried about the spiritual, emotional, physical well-being of a relationship in our life, uh, We've been through trauma, someone's been through trauma and then worry that their reaction's going to stay angry the rest of their life. They're never going to change that and they're going to struggle with relationships. And that's a worry, right? We're afraid of things. A worry list. I want to tell you something that um, I didn't even tell Patty yet. <laughs> but as I was preparing last night, I said to myself, you know, one of the things that I have uh, after these five weeks are over is to spend a, a half a day Saturday, uh, one, a Saturday if you're wanting and willing to do it, together, half a day, in prayer over the things we're worried about. Because we're to pray about those things, not worry about them. And I have done three half days of prayer in my life. Now you might think you should be more spiritual than that, I've done more than that, but that's all I was able to do, three up to this point. But every time I've spent a half a day focusing on God, focusing on asking Him to help me with ways He and His Word has said He wanted to help me, things have happened as a result of that. This ministry was birthed out of a half day of prayer. <laughs> so why don't I spend more time in prayer? I don't know. I'm worried making things happen. happen right? We can worry about all these things. I want you to make that worry list, though. and f Because this is what some people are tempted to wake up in the middle of the night thinking. This is what motivates them to not do good, but to often walk outside of their responsibility, say things they shouldn't say, do things they shouldn't do, because they're worrying about something that isn't their responsibility. 
They don't have control of it. It's God's responsibility. Let me read some more of what Jerry Bridges writes about worry and about trusting God. Here's a list of things. There may be the heartache of an unhappy marriage, the disappointment of a miscarried pregnancy, the grief over a spiritually indifferent or rebellious child. There's the anxiety of the family breadwinner who has just lost his job and the despair of the young mother who has learned she has a terminal illness. Others experience the frustration of dashed hopes, unfulfilled dreams, a business that turns sour, a career that never developed, the sting of injustice, the ache of loneliness, the stabbing pain of unexpected grief, the humiliation of being rejected by others, the motion at work, maybe worst of all, Jerry Bridges writes, the failure, the failure that is one's own fault, the consequences of a failure that's your own fault. Finally, there's the despair realizing that some circumstances, a physical affirmity, a handicapped child, will never change. So all these and scores of others contribute to the anxiety and emotional pain we all experience at various times. In addition to our own emotional pains, we often call upon to bear the pain of others and hear about others' relatives like has been shared already. We read the daily newspapers, see the evening news, instances of grief, heartache, and pain on a mass scale. All these things. It is true that such mundane events in our life that we get worried about that are small pale in comparison to the bigger things that we can be concerned and worry, worried about. Um, so, we're going to have three columns that we think of on that list. When you made that worry list, when we think about trusting God, so we have, a, we'll have our worry list. All the things that I'm tempted to worry about. And then what we're going to learn to do is, is take that list and learn what is God's list in that list? What is God in charge of that you're worried about, right? What does God say, this is my job to change the heart of a person, to change the environment, to change the situation? And then lead to this, uh, my list. What has is, what is God given you to do, right? Do you know there are times that I'm concerned about things and it comes past my mind and I can't say it? to people. <laughs> That's a news flash. What do you think of that? Sometimes I think of concerns I have and it's like this is not your job. Be quiet. Right? And my wife will tell you I think I've gotten better over the years of that. What do you think, hon? Yeah. I'm a counselor so my job is to anticipate problems. <laughs> people come to me to say help me avoid worse problems and figure out how to solve this problem. So can you imagine if I run that engine at home, what I can anticipate, right? We have a 20-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 12-year-old, and an 8-year-old. So there's plenty of worry, right? And my wife, her middle name is Peace, and she's gentle, and mine is what? <laughs> Tim Concerned. Bryant, right? Worry. No, no, I was worried. No, I didn't even worry. So I concern. But I have had to learn how not to share my concerns unless it's on my list to share. What do I do instead of share my list? I pray, right? Because it's God's list, right? I want you to turn in your Bible just for a moment to Philippians chapter 4. Very Familiar passage, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. We are going to 
look at God's Word in many ways and His promises to us. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be anxious for what? All right. So God is saying, here's, here's your worry list, right? Uh, this is a command, right? So nothing on my concern list should I ever be anxious about. Let me move this tree out of the way. It's amazing how we can move trees. <laughs> Your faith can move mountains. It can move trees too. We have, uh, be anxious for nothing. So Jesus Christ and God and the Apostle Paul is telling us, worry about nothing. Be anxious for nothing. doesn't mean not be concerned. If you're not concerned you're at, uh, enough, you're probably unloving. I mean, you know, if there's bad things going on and you're like, ah, just don't be concerned about it. That's different than worry, right? There's a natural response we should have. But be anxious for nothing. But instead, what does it say? Right, right, right. So we're going to pray uh, in everything, right? Right. So we're going to, yeah, with thanksgiving, right? So we are taking, when we talk about God's list, uh, we are approaching a God with thanksgiving for all he's done. And we're praying and everything. So we're taking our worry list and turning it into a prayer list, right? Presenting it to God. And then, so we're already up to verse uh, 7 right now, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but everything, prayer and thanksgiving. Present your request to God. The result is the peace of God that passes understanding. Will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Um, so, verse 9, though, gives us our list. Someone read verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Right. So what you have heard, received, learned from me, the Apostle Paul, as I, what Christ would do here, you do here. Right? So what is my list, right? So we have that in Philippians 4.9. We are to practice uh, uh, Christ-likeness, right? We're to, pra we're to be like Christ. And, and res as a result of being anxious for nothing, praying and everything, and giving that to God, and practicing what we're supposed to practice in that time, being faithful, being loving, the peace of God will guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus, and the God of peace will be with us. So, would you rather have, here's the hard question for you, I know, would you rather have peaceful circumstances or would you rather have the God of peace with you? It's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> we know the Sunday school answer is we have the God of peace with me. Because what is peaceful circumstances without the God of peace with you? Could it be that God puts us in unpeaceful circumstances to teach us how to have the God of peace with us more? How to do that which allows Him to live in us deeper? Isn't that what He's been doing for centuries? Isn't that why when you look out and you say, God, why don't you just solve it all? He says, I'm doing something more important. I'm solving my people's problems. Inward. Now, I am not sitting here telling you that your circumstances that you're worried about are not significant. And if I didn't sympathize with them, I'd be, I'd be a bad person. But I'm telling you, God wants to give you the God of peace in you and the peace of God with you first and foremost. That's what Jesus had. And that's what trusting God is going to seek to help you do and accomplish. Look at your, or, your, your uh, outline here for a minute. God commands us to trust Him. And you can put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 there. You guys can probably quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of you. But this is a command to trust. Trust in the Lord with all your what? All your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. So there's four parts to that verse. So it's a command to trust Him with all of your heart. 
Trust Him with all of your heart. Trust is a spiritual affection. And that's what you want to put on that blank there. I'm going to write it on the board so you know. I'm going to fill it out. It's a spiritual... Whoa, that marker's not working. I'm just going to stick with the black here. So it's a spiritual affection. Okay? Trust is a spiritual affection. You see the word, word affect and shun, the act of, the act of affecting me? What we're talking about here, it's a spiritual affection. It's from the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to trust in Him with all of your heart. Can anyone here uh, trust God? Let's all try to trust God. It's a, let's do it right now. Ready? Here we go. How's it working? You doing it? No, God has to affect you, right? God has to reveal something to you that makes him appear trustworthy to your eyes, to your understanding. You have to say, God, you are trustworthy. He has to help your eyes see and comprehend. What does Romans 12, 10, 17 say? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Faith is a spiritual affection. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Hearing. Some people hear with their physical ears and others hear with their spiritual ears, right? Some people see with their physical eyes and others see spiritual eyes. Who gave them the eyes and the ears to hear, right? Faith comes by hearing the Word. Trust comes by hearing the word faith is not a gift from you faith is a gift from god trust is a gift from god it's not obey this list it's trust the god who obey who gives you the list it's not merely obey god it's trust god who gave you what to do for instance if you look at this here uh, practice christ likeness when someone is not treating you well Right? How are you going to do that? How are you going to practice Christ's likeness if someone's not treating you? It's hard, it's impossible without faith to please God, the Scripture says. It's impossible because you won't do it. How could I do it unless I have a reason to obey? And trust gives us the reason to obey. It's a spiritual affection in us. Someone has to convince you and me that God is trustworthy. And that's God, through His Word, as you hear it, as you think on it, convinces us. Trust Him. Don't react to this person. Trust God in this. God is trustworthy. Turn to 2 Timothy for a minute, chapter 2, verse 7. I want to show you the cooperation that is required for God to give you and me. And that's what this study, what we're here to do, to teach us to trust Him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 says this. My version says this. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Consider what I say means to think deeply on it. 2 Timothy 2, 7. Think deeply on the Word of God. Faith comes by what? Hearing. How do I hear it? By thinking deeply on it, right? And it says there that God will give you the understanding in everything. The understanding of why to trust Him. The understanding of how do I handle this differently. A lot of times people know what not to do in a situation before they know what to do. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> I know I shouldn't yell. I know I shouldn't throw a fit. I know I shouldn't, you know, throw something at you. <laughs> I know I shouldn't, you know, go uh, check the door another time or get out of bed, wake you up. I, I know I shouldn't go research another hour about this topic I've already researched three hours on. I know I shouldn't do that, right? But I don't know what to do. And so we need to start often by not doing what we know not to do. That's, how, that's the beginning of Christ's likeness to put off and the Holy Spirit begins to give you understanding in what you need to be doing as you consider His Word. Um, the, uh, 
the cooperative effort, the second blank here is, if we're going to have spiritual affection, it requires a cooperative effort. I've got to get rid of this marker. I'm going to pick it up 100. Would you just take this marker from me? Thanks. <laughs> um, a cooperative effort. All right. So it's a cooperative effort where I reflect on the Word and God gives me understanding. Um, what are some of the things we cooperate with God? How do we do it? How do we reflect on the Word? Doing this study is part of this. Faith comes by hearing the Word. So we're going to divert, learn a, to develop a practice of, of not just reading the Bible, not just studying the Bible, but meditating on it. And we'll talk about meditation in just a little bit, but it's important that we realize without meditating on the Word, we can't really hear it. Um, we have to concentrate on the truth, and that's what we're trying to do in this study. What, what's the goal of getting trust to occur in our lives, in our heart? What's the goal of that? The goal of such an affection. What is the goal? Um, I want you to turn to Psalm 37.3. 37.3, the goal of such an affection. And I want someone to read that. It's so simple. Psalm 37.3. What do you have there? Trust in the Lord to do good, dwell in the land, and cultivate faithfulness. Right. So trust in the Lord and what? Do good. Do good. So here's God's list again if we're looking at this. Here we're, we're trust, trusting in the Lord and we're doing what? Good. That's my list. We're trusting in the Lord and doing good. So the goal of such an affection is doing good. Is that pretty simple? The goal of learning to trust God is that we would do good by God's definition of what is good. Sometimes good is speaking, sometimes good is not speaking. When do I know the difference? The scripture is your word is the light to your path. Is it loving? to speak right now. And my wife would tell you that in our early years, I, when I would want to say something, I would often say it, but then as I got in our marriage further, I realized I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't bring this up now. It's nighttime or we're tired. or You know, when you are anxious is not a good time to talk. Right? When should I speak? Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in anxiety. It doesn't say it says, speak the truth in love. When you're at a place that you can speak because you love God and you love that person, you're doing good now. You can address the problem, but you can't address it in anxiety, right? But if you trust God, you can speak now into that much better. So trust in the Lord and do good. You could say also that the goal of such an affection is transformation, not just therapy, not just emotional change, but transformation. That's what doing good will do for you. Now, if you're on Psalm 73, or 37, sorry, Psalm 37, you'll see in Psalm 37 that we have uh, the first command here is fret not yourself, right? Uh, because of evildoers. Don't be envious of wrongdoers. So the psalmist here is talking about being mistreated. He is talking to someone who's being mistreated by an evildoer. Someone's getting away with something. And the counsel to that person is verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. That's your job but I want to resolve this. I want to fix this. It's not your job. <laughs> What's my job? To do good. That's, that's hard to swallow. But if you trust the Lord, you can do this. Now, what are you trusting God for? What does it mean to trust God? Well, if you look at Psalm 37, did you know 
that there are 16 or more, if you depends on how you count them, promises that have been given to the one who trusts God. You're not just trusting God to make everything perfect. You're trusting God to do what he has said he will do. And you know what some of the promises are? Things like, you will inherit the land, right? You will get this good. I mean, look at Psalm 37. You look, I don't have my Bible. I have it in someone else's Bible. You have, you have 16 or so promises. You have 16 or so consequences. Let's just, let me just pop them out here for you. Um, Look what it says in verse 8. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Uh, verse 9, uh, oh, verse 10. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. There's a consequence. Verse 11, but the meek will inherit the land. Trust that's coming. Are you being meek, right? We could fill out our verse again here, guys, our chart. Uh, God makes a promise that you'll inherit the land, and so your job is to be meek, right? Remember, meek is having self-control. You may, you may have the power to do something and get revenge, but you're controlling it and saying, this isn't good. I can't do this. It's Jesus Christ on the cross when the most unjust thing ever happening, the most painful thing in terms of spiritual and emotional and relational rejection of God, a man who's done no wrong. And he looks out and he has the ability to call legions of angels to protect him, to slay those in front of him. And they're, they're mocking him like he's got no power. And he held back. He was meek. You know what I mean? He was meek. This is what the Scripture, these promises, you go through Psalm 37, you'll see them. What is God, why is God giving us this? Because he's wanting to inform your trust with his promises. That there is coming a resolution that only He can bring. There's, so, so when you don't trust God, you don't do good. And on your list here, you have th uh, we're going to look at faithless responses in a moment, but I want to talk about first three types of adversity that all of us face. Um, and I'm going to put a, three symbols up here, and you can probably tell me we have this kind of adversity, Okay, and then we have this kind of adversity, and then we have this kind of adversity. So, that, I, I'm symbol guy, you know. Those are emojis, I guess. I don't know what you want to call them. But we have, we have the kind of adversity that comes from other people, right? We have this kind of adversity. Uh, and it could be unintended adversity. Uh, weaknesses that someone you really appreciate and value keeps messing with your life, right? They forget something. They, they are, they are a neat freak, or they're messy, or they're you know whatever it is. They have a weakness in a certain area, or maybe it's a sin of another person. They've mistreated you. You know, they ignore you. They re reject you. They've spoke evil of you. They go behind your back. You know, and all these sorts of things. That's adversity. We have to trust God in that. The second thing is, is uh, what what uh, we what the, what the um, insurance companies call acts of what <laughs> acts of god right so that's like hurricanes right uh, all kinds of things that are not from people around us but they're just un mysterious they just happen right uh, it was no f no human fault no human error involved here the lightning strikes right we had a tree fall on our house during certain hurricanes that were coming, and, right? But that tree could have been cut down by our neighbors before it fell on our house. So I think it was both an act of God and an act of our neighbor. My wife even warned the neighbor about the tree leaning and rotted, but it fell <laughs> anyway, right? And there it was in our house, not in our house, on our house. It's kind of a funny story, but wasn't funny when I was talking to the insurance company and I said after talking to the neighbor they were, they were going to tell the insurance company that yeah they were they should have cut it down they, they were told warned they didn't do any of that I said she didn't tell you that no and I, I wasn't trusting the Lord and doing good at that moment but I got it right after that you ever get shaken like that hopefully after you get shaken you go do good after that you go get it right seek forgiveness 
discussing that the neighbor was told, or were you discussing it? What was that? <laughs> My question was, were you trusting God alone, or were you trusting the fact that you told the neighbor and then that you... Yeah, so was it God or my neighbor who did it? <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But then this last one, this is maybe the hardest one to trust God in. What do you think this reflects? If this is other inflicted, and this is sort of clearly God inflicted, no one really had any part in this, this is what? Self inflicted. And dare I say that maybe a lot, most of our adversity is self inflicted, and in terms of we internalize what others do to us, and then we're inflicted by what we've done to ourselves internally. Or maybe we made decisions in a rash manner, a reaction to other people, and now we're suffering consequences. So self-inflicted. Maybe we're overworking and we reap the consequences of neglect. Maybe we are not overworking, maybe we're underworking and reap the consequences of the neglect, right? Maybe we're overworking on things that aren't as important as the other things we're underworking in. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe we've invested in a dream that isn't that valuable and lost the dreams that are valuable. Those are hard to say, can I trust God now to do good? Is there a promise for me here to hold on to? I mean, how, who, many in this room, who in this room does not have regrets, right? Where do, are we to dwell on those? Or are we just to repent? and then trust Him to do good on the other side of all the neglect I've had, the sin I've committed. Can God be trusted to take my self-inflicted sin, what I've done to myself, and turn good into it? Ask the Apostle Paul, right? Ask any of the people that have suffered because of their sin and then God has redeemed it. Yes, sir. David and Bathsheba. Messes David messes up, you know, yeah. And it's almost, you know, you know he's, he's crying with the baby and he's just over it. You know, his sins are covered. And God makes good of it. Solomon ends up being born. And it's, just, it's a great story to read. That yeah. He's yeah. That's right. Yeah. So God somehow makes good of it. That's right. And God. Right. Yeah, so there's. God always has a better story on the other side for those who are His. But if we don't trust Him, it, there's a lot of pain getting there because we're going to do bad along the way. If we only knew good was coming, we could hold better. Let's keep going here. Typical faithless responses in adversity. I want to give you some of those. Uh, well, Matthew 6, uh, do not worry. Is worry a faithless response, right? How do I know that? Because Jesus said at the end of that, ye of little what? Faith, uh, you're not trusting me. Um, in Matthew 6, if you've ever heard Jesus telling them, do not worry about your life, verse 25 down to 34, what a great passage to be meditating on. Do not worry about your life, what you eat, what you drink. Is not life more than clothes and the bo- or more than food and, li- and body more than clothes? And who of you can, by worry, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And, Look at the birds of the air. Aren't you more valuable than they? Your Father takes care of them. Look at the lilies of the field. Aren't they more clothed more beautifully than you? And he says, your Father knows you need these things before you ask. So here we have Jesus telling him, do not worry, right? But what does he tell him to do in verse 33 since we're filling this chart out? But what? What's my job, God? To, to uh, go make sure that I got enough? Seek first what? Kingdom. Right. His righteousness, that means doing right, right? And kingdom. Right? So we have Matthew 6. Do not worry. It's God's list. To t- God feeds the birds. God clothes the lilies of the field. God will provide. Now what do you need to do? Go seek His kingdom. Go do what's right. It always comes back to that. Worry is a faithless response. Anger. Um, 
If I have any folks in this room that have the personality type of what the scripture would call a prophet, in other words, someone who likes to get in and get out and get it done, right? Just rip out whatever needs to be ripped out and say, now you're healed, right? <laughs> Just say what needs to say. Say it off the cuff. Just say it direct. Those people that have that personality, they like the passage that says, be angry, but sin not, right? <laughs> be angry. <laughs> Access, speak your mind, let it out, unfiltered, here it is. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. But, look, but let's, let's quantify this, because that can be a faithless response. Anger can be a faithless response. You're taking it into your own hands. You're trying to fix the problem outside of your responsibility, and you think anger is going to accomplish it, right? James chapter 1 Verse 14, 15 in that ballpark, actually 21 says, uh, the anger of man doesn't accomplish the righteousness of God. But it, Ephesians says, in your anger, don't sin, or be angry and don't sin. And it goes on to say, do not let the sun go down on your anger. So what we do know is even if you have righteous anger, you've got to get rid of it quick. At least you can't go to sleep on it. You've got to resolve it somewhere. And the way you resolve it is you trust God and you do your job. Right? You trust God instead of worry about it. And then if it's your job, you, you discern what does love say to do here. How would I handle this? How should I speak? Should I speak or not? Should I act or not? When I don't know if I should do something or not and I'm concerned, I go to prayer, I go to Scripture, I try to figure out if there's a principle. I may go to someone I respect and say, what do you think the Lord would have me do here? Right? And then I do that thing. Sometimes I go to my wife, but remember I told you I can't always tell her what I'm concerned about. But I'll go to her and I'll say, should I be concerned about this? And she'll say no or yes. And it gives me a good perspective to say, what would the normal person do? <laughs> you ever feel like maybe you're not always normal in terms of how you look at things? It's important that we get sometimes help. Should, what do I do with this anger? What do I do with this worry? Another faithless response is despair. Or depression, right? Because uh, depression is not that it's you're looking at the bad side of life and you're discouraged about it. Depression is that you don't believe there's any hope. It's the loss of hope. Now, how do we know that's a faithless response? Remember the passage, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things what? Hope for. Faith is a gift from God, right? God gives you faith. If you have faith tonight, you have hope. Maybe you haven't informed your faith with the promises that then lead to hope. And that's why you're here. So we can look at the promises that feed your faith that you have hope. Hope in what? And we'll talk about that in a second. There's another response to Faith to adversity that's faithless, and that's neglect, where you just become a hermit. You pull back, right? You maybe get undisciplined in your eating. You get sleep routines, just change everything. You get slack on caring for yourself and the training of your children. And it's a faithless response because you think that the king has stopped reigning and he's not coming back. You're left to yourself. When the king returns, let him find you doing his will. Right? Let him find you. Yes. Faith. Assurance of what I'm hoping to happen that's good, that God has promised, right? Then, then you have sinful escapes. That's the last uh, faithless response I'd tell you. Is, is sinful escape, trying to escape. And we could talk about drugs and drinking here and hanging out with the wrong crowd and unwise spending habits, you know, inappropriate relationships with the opposite sex. We're just escaping the adversity. We're fleeing it. Only to jump from the frying pan into the fire now, right? We went from this kind of affliction and maybe this kind of affliction and now we're heaping up on ourselves worse consequences. The wages of sin is death, Right? But the gift of God is life. All in place of trusting God and doing good. 
sinful escapes instead of trusting God and doing good. If you have Psalm 37 open, I want you to look at this for a minute. Verse 8, I wanted to show you this and I forgot to share it with you. Verse 8 actually uses anger as a faithless response. Look, it says, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. That means don't be worried. It tends only to what? Evil. evil. It tends only to evil. So the next time you start worrying or having despair in your thoughts, you've got to stop listening to yourself, right? And start leading your thoughts. Don't listen to your thoughts. You've got to lead them. And the Word of God wants to say, first of all, stop, right? Stop this. Fret not yourself, but it's only going to lead to evil, and then you're going to have self-inflicted evil upon the evil happening to you. And we've been there, done that, right? Got to hear that when we struggle. So let's talk about what it really means to trust God. All right. What does it really mean to trust God? In the arena of adversity, the Scriptures teach us three essential truths about God's truth. Of truths we must believe if we're to trust Him in adversity. So we're going to see God is completely sovereign. Okay? So, sovereign is the word. So here, sovereign means reign over. Right? So God is reigning over. So, in some sense, God is over all of these adversities. Uh, I can pragmatically prove it to you in some sense, but I want to biblically prove it to you, but let me just pragmatically for a minute. Do you know that when my wife and I got married, we didn't know what we were really getting into? We had two or three counselors, and I still didn't know what we were getting into. Did we, hon? Did you think I'd be better or worse than I? Don't answer that. <laughs> we didn't know what we were getting into. God did, right? And Lamentations 3.37 says, Who can speak and have it happen unless the Lord Almighty ordained it? God could have had me drop dead of a heart attack before I said, I do, right? <laughs> he didn't. So we're married. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Self -inflict, uh, other inflicted. God can stop anything. He could stop the breath of any enemy in your and my life. Right? When Jesus looked out at Pilate, he said, you'd have no power over me unless it given you from above. So let's get to the cross, shall we? <laughs> he didn't say that, but that's, right? Because it's there that I'm going to do my best work. Nobody wants the cross, right? Nobody's asking for it. But do you believe that your God is over your crosses, right? Now, we know acts of God, hurricane is not Mother Nature, so we're okay with that one. We all believe weather, God's, that weather is in the hands of God, right? The, the, the hurricane that came in and leveled the house and killed all Job's children, we see in the book of Job that uh, God gave Satan permission to do certain things, but it was God who was over that. And, but this one, I want you to realize that sin always brings consequences, but sometimes they're delayed. And did you know that those people going to hell have delayed consequences coming for them? And God's children often do not have delayed consequences. <laughs> Why? Right? Because he wants you to share in his, the best thing he can give you, which is his holiness, his likeness. First Peter chapter 4, you can look for it later, but it says, it is with difficulty that the righteous are saved. So, so God allows us to taste our consequences sometimes in this life, more than the world gets to taste their consequences, to teach us. I go up to change lives every Thursday, and there's... Always a group of men there have been addicted all their life to drugs and sex and you know, all this stuff. 
and they're dysfunctional. And I say to them, if your life is dysfunctional and Jesus Christ has not been your Lord, right, that's a good sign. Because it's those whose life is functional without Christ that is a bad thing. Life should not work without Christ. And so we know that consequences, even the consequences you're tasting, have to be given by God. God has to say, that's going to happen. Right? So all that to say, God is sovereign. God is perfect. God is completely sovereign. God is perfect in love. That's the second one. God is perfect in love. He's completely sovereign. He is infinite in wisdom. These three attributes of God, God is sovereign, He's perfect in love, and He's infinite in wisdom. And someone has expressed these three truths as they relate to us in this way. God in His love always wills what is best for us. In His wisdom, He always knows what is best for us. And His sovereignty has the power to bring it about. And I think of it as a baseball diamond, okay? Everything's a baseball diamond. I don't know why to me. But I think of the fact that God's sovereignty, that He's over all, he's on, that's on first base. God is sovereign. He has, in other words, God has the power to do anything He wants. Psalm 115.3 He does as He pleases with the sons of men. Isaiah 46.10 My purpose will stand. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. <laughs> Ephesians 1.11, uh, God works everything out according to the counsel of His will. All things, right? He is completely sovereign. Blank chalkboard. What do you want to do today, God? I can do whatever I want. First base, that's, that's who's on first. I can do whatever I want. Second base is His love. His love says, well, I know what I want to do with that power. What does God want to do with His love in your life? He wants to give you the best He's got, Right? If I love somebody, I want to give them the best I got. I will do everything I can to give them everything I've got. If I, the more I love them, the more I give them. And God is infinite in love for us. He doesn't just like us. He does more than that. He loves us. Now, third base is his wisdom. And God's wisdom is saying, well, if you want to do that to them, and you've got the power to do it, I know how to get it done. And you know how he does that? Often is adversity. Isn't that something? He gives us His best things in what's going on in our life. Right now, you don't have to change anything except your response to everything. Right? Your response to everything is more important than what's going on right now in your life. Because God has loaded the bases in your life with His sovereignty, His love, and His wisdom. And up to bat, guess who's up to bat? This is what I like to say. His faithfulness. Meaning he's consistent. Meaning he never misses a, a swing. He hits it perfect every time. Nails it. And my life and your life will look back one day and understand the wisdom of the path he took us through. Sometimes we get it on the front end, we understand it, but oftentimes it's, it's mysterious how we got here. So here's your blanks here. These three attributes of God. I believe God is completely sovereign. He is above all. Just put the word all there. Number one, I, can, I believe He's completely sovereign. He's above all in His rule and is the source of power behind all. He's the source of power behind all. God is above all. He's the source of power uh, behind all. It's not, and when we think about that, it's not the economy uh, that's in charge of the results. Uh, it's not the people in our life that's the char in charge of, of all of the things, good or bad, that's going on. God is completely sovereign. It's not the doctors. It's not the judge. In the end, God wins. In the end, He accomplishes all His good pleasure. And the second thing is, uh, well, first thing is, if I believe God is completely sovereign, I believe God in this trial can, well, how would you fill that in? If God is completely sovereign in the trial, the things you're worried about, God can, if He wants to, do what? Give me some thoughts on that. He can end it. 
He can fix it. He can stop it. He can make it worse, right? <laughs> he can bring you through it. He can resolve you. He can take you on to be with Him, right? Right now. He can do anything. That's what it means to trust God. That is what it means first to trust God. God, you can stop this. And I remember when I was very sick in my early 20s and I would walk around the block. And even when I got married, I still was sick at times. And I'd walk around the block and I would say, God, you could stop this. Give me my health. You know if you gave me my health back, I could do more for you. <laughs> yeah. God can do anything. Do you trust Him tonight that He's completely sovereign? That should change the way you fret. You haven't told you what to do yet, but you should change the way that you think over and over and over again when it's not your job. You're done with this, right? You have, a, you have a specific job here, and it's to love and be faithful to what God would call you to. But He's sovereign, not you. And then the second thing is I believe God is perfect in goodness and love. And that, that, what, what would define that this way? He spares no personal expense. The word is expense. He, he spares no personal expense in meeting the needs of others and satisfying them with His goodness. Even enemies. His love is both infinite and unending. Or I'm sorry, unconditional. I'm sorry guys, I messed up there. Unconditional. His love is not conditioned upon our response to Him. And it's unending. If that is true, and Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us God demonstrated this love in that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. You know, God died for us in our unworthiness, showing that He was unconditionally loving toward us. If He didn't spare His own Son for us, Romans 8, will He not also give us with Him everything we need? Right? If God is love, loving in this way, then therefore I believe what? I believe God in this trial will what? If or God in this trial desires what? If He is loving, what does He desire in this trial for us? What would you say? He desires what is best for us, right? He desires to give us what is best. Yeah. And then thirdly, I believe God is infinite in wisdom. What's that mean? Wisdom is the ability to select the best end of action. That means the goal. The best means, with the best means for accomplishing this end. In other words, if I wanted to get from here to Somerville, the straightest way to get there, and that's how God does it, right? The best way to get there. If I want to bring about something in your life that is the best, God would say God has that as the goal and He has the best way to get there. Um, God's wisdom is what? That's three things. It, it is uh, infallible. That's a bigger word, but it just means it, can't be, it cannot fail. Uh, I make a plan and I sometimes, it sometimes works, right? You ever make plans, they don't work out? God's plans always work out. His plan is infinite. His wisdom is infinite. And the next last word is the best one of all. It's intuitive. So when, God, when you say, God, um, how did you create the world in six days? And you think about all the things that that implies. Now you say, God would say back to you, it just came to me. Did you think about it a long time? No. It just came to me. The best way to do it. God, what's that? Intuitive. The third, last one. So if you said, God, when you were planning out human history and you understood fall of man and you understood history of mankind and the devastation and everything that would come after that, how did you come up with that? <laughs> it just came to me. This was the best way to accomplish my will. And what is God's goal? What is His purpose in all things? Two things. He's got two things He wants to do. That's is it. God's a two-person goal here. Two-person God. Two-goal two God. What are they? Yeah. 
Okay, so we got that one. He wants to glorify His name. You know what that means? He wants to make Himself more gloriously appearing to the angels and to us. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be marveled at. Like C.S. Lewis said, God is like an old woman who wants compliments. That doesn't sound too good, does it? That was before he got converted. Right? But he said that's how he used to think of God. Because he would read the Bible in a God-centered way because it's all over the place. God is wanting to be worshipped. That's all he did. He does it for his own glory. But why else does he do everything? For the, for the good of his children. I'm a dad. If my children need me, I am there. And I'm evil. How much more our God, right? He is there for us. We want him to do it like this, and he says, no, in my wisdom, I don't do it like that because I'm doing something better for you. I'm teaching you how to be patient, teaching you how to trust me. That's bigger than getting what you want. I'm making you confident in me instead of confident in yourself and in your circumstances. Why does God take people through adversity? Teach them how to stop trusting in themselves. You know, God has to clip us off sometimes and teach us that we're not that big and that, not that, that amazing. You know, we really think we're pretty amazing sometimes. And God says, I need to teach you that I'm the source of this, so I've got to take it away for a little while. Right? I love better because of what God has done to me that I haven't liked always. So, God has made a mess of your life, you feel maybe, but you haven't heard the last chapter yet. Are you going to stick around till He writes it? Some people want to burn the book before the book's finished. Right? God is still writing. He is still doing things, right? I'm, I'm excited when I think about the wisdom of God because when I think of the world, I know how he can do things. Amazing, beyond me. Did you know there's 37 billion, a trillion, sorry, 37 trillion cells in your body? Can you even count that high? Well, I've heard it takes more than a lifetime just to count that high. But there's that many cells in the seven, is it billion people we have on earth? Now, you take all that and you think that every cell is as complex as the New York City traffic. And God is in charge of that. No, who's in charge of that stuff? Would someone tell me who's in charge, please? God is. And you think He's not aware? And you don't think He can't do something with the problems you've got? Trust in the Lord and what? Do good. Right? So, if you believe in God's wisdom, I believe this God and this trial will do what? What would you, how would you say it? What will God do in this trial if, if He is all-powerful and He's all-loving and He's all-wise and He can do anything He wants and He will do it? I believe in this trial, God will what? How would you say it? I believe God will transform me. That's a good way. I believe God will figure out how to transform me. That's why you're here tonight. I hope you're not here for me to try to help solve your circumstances. I'm here to help you solve your heart issue. To trust Him. And that God wants to transform your heart. And then you can do good out of that. Now I want to talk about circumstantially though, what would you say? I believe God with this circumstance, if He is loving, if He is wise, that somehow in the end, what, what will happen? What will happen in the end if God is wise and loving? He'll do right by you. He'll do right by you. Okay. <laughs> He'll be right. what do you, what, it's good. I'm going to tell you what I have said repeatedly, and Marianne probably knows what I say. All right, so Marianne, Can you answer that one? You're, Marianne's going to answer this question. Go ahead. If something bad happens, God will cause the results to be far better than if the bad had never happened. Right, so what that means is the, the good, yeah, the bad, okay. So Marianne, say it again. <laughs> if, something bad if something bad happens, God will cause... The result, that's the key word. God will cause the result of the bad to be better than if the bad had never occurred. Are you okay with that? What's that? There's so many dimensions of what better could come. We've already heard, I will be transformed. That's better. I wouldn't have been transformed had I had rosy skies, you know, or 
beautiful weather. God will bring a good result. And if you question that, we can look at the cross of Christ. The worst day of human history became the what? The best day. We can look at the life of Joseph and the worst circumstances in Joseph's life positioned him for what? The best days in Joseph's life. And by the way, he saved all of the mankind at the time from the drought and the, the, the famine that was going on. Right? You look at Job's worst days. Turned out in many dimensions, his best came. Because he got to see the Lord. Everything was restored fourfold or sevenfold. I don't remember. I'm, I'm messing up. I should have studied that one, right? But you get to, and also we get to read the book. We get to read the book of Joseph, Job's life and we get to be encouraged. That could have never happened without Job going through that. You guys think you have problems? Read Job tonight. Learn how to trust him. Learn how to trust that God. That's why it's there. And then uh, we're going to end with this thought. Learning how to meditate. James Packer says that the Christian instincts of trust and worship are stimulated very powerfully by knowledge of the greatness of God. But this is knowledge which Christians today largely lack. And that is one reason why our faith is feeble and our worship flabby. We are modern men. and Modern men cherish great thoughts about man and have as a rule small thoughts about God. So, if we're going to learn to trust God, we're going to have to anchor that trust in scriptures. Just put the word scriptures. Well meditated on and prayed through. Scriptures well meditated on and prayed through. Anchor that trust in one or more of the three essential attributes of God. And, and tonight, what are the three? This is a test. Sovereignty of God. What else? The love of God and the wisdom of God. The grand slam, right? All three of those are operating in your life. I want to encourage you. This study is going to teach you to meditate on Romans chapter 8. You're, you have a goal to memorize Romans 8. Patty, what verse does it start at and end at? 18, 18 through 39. Can you guys memorize uh, that many verses in the Bible? Romans 8, 18 through 39. Many verses, huh? How are you going to do that? You're going to do that by creating 3 by 5 cards. Okay? You're going to take them with you. And you're going to meditate on those 3 by 5 cards. And this is the last thing I'm going to show you is how to meditate. I want to teach you about how to meditate here. I need, a, I need space. Um, so, if we talk about meditating on God, um, this is a little illustration that I use to help people learn how to meditate on God. One of the things that we do not do is think deeply about any concepts once we graduate uh, high school or once we graduate college or our doctor or whatever. We stop thinking deeply about things. And we just start living. And in this world of uh, smartphones, we have information all the time coming at us. All the time. That means that your gray matter isn't growing in your brain very well. That means you're highly distractible. You're not deeply implanted in any one thought long enough to actually understand deeply anything. And when we're trying to know God, we're going to have to meditate on Him. We're going to have to say, you know what? I'm putting aside the worry list. I'm putting aside, I don't know what to do. Get rid of that, all those things. And I'm going to spend the next 20 and 30 minutes on a walk, worshiping God as I meditate. And so you take a passage like Romans chapter 8, verse 19, and I'm going to turn there just to give you an example of this, so teach you how to meditate so that when you go home after we split here tonight, guys and girls split up here in a moment, uh, Patty will be with the ladies. I'll be with the, the men. Verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Is it eight, 18, right, Patty? Yeah, sorry, not 19. Sorry about that. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to memorize that passage. I'm going to put the first letter of each word. Someone read that verse one more time out of that translation I just had. Four? Is it four? Okay, NIV. What do you have there? NIV. Who has... You have King James. What do you want? New American? Uh, ESV. Yeah, give me ESV for now. Okay. Here it is. We're just going to do this. For I consider, for I consider that, the sufferings of that the sufferings of this present time, present time are, not worth are not worth comparing with the glory, with the glory that is to be, that is to be Revealed. Is that it? Okay, great. So that's 18. So my little card that I make looks like that. Now you say, that gonna, that's going to frustrate me. Now first, you're going to learn how to know the verse by looking at that. Phrase at a time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, is it times or time? Times. Time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. Oop. Started to write the whole word to us. Right? Okay. So don't freak out. You can do this. It's a phrase at a time. So what I'm doing on a walk is I'm memorizing. Okay? Memorize one phrase at a time. Okay? So my first phrase would be this one right here, right? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. So as I'm walking, I'm walking around the block in the warmth of winter, because compared to Chicago, it's warm here. Okay, that's where I grew up. <laughs> For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. And I, I repeat that phrase to myself. And what, what happens when you're repeating that phrase to yourself? Your worries starting to hit you. and Oh, I've got things to do in a minute. <laughs> Nothing's more important than this. You're trying to, you're trying to grow your gray matter, okay? <laughs> you're trying to know God. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, and I might slow it down. For I consider, and I say, I've already forgot what it was. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, of this present time, for I consider, and I may emphasize a new word each time, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, for I consider that the sufferings, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, as I'm going into this, I'm going hungry to learn to trust God, hungry to let faith feed my need to have faith, right? To have the word feed my need for faith. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, your worry list. Father, I made that worry list in class Thursday night. You're trying to tell me that I should consider the sufferings of this present time. Right? Not worthy to be compared. I'm getting ahead of this. I've been thinking. And so I'll stop for a moment. And you know what I'll do? I'll go up from my memorization and I will, of all things, let God interrupt it. And I'll go up to God and I will soon come down from God to get back to memorizing, okay? This is meditation. I go up to God, I pray, I come back down to the science of the words. This is meditation. This is what we're not doing, yet it's the number one command of what we're supposed to do in the Scripture. More than studying it, more than reading it, more than hearing it. Those things are all critical. We are to meditate on it. The most neglected spiritual discipline right here. We pray more than we do this. And that's saying a lot because we don't pray enough. But what do we do when we go up? I'm going to give you three things to do. You're worshiping God, right? The scripture can inform your worship as you go up there and talk to God. Maybe a song. I think of songs. You're coming down. You're worshiping. You are uh, confessing. Okay? 
It's a lot to confess. God, I have not considered the sufferings of my present time. I have compared. I have, please forgive me for yelling. <laughs> oh, a faithless response. I should not have worried. Oh, God, help me. And all of a sudden, you've got the right conversation going now in your head for the first time. Healing is coming. Help is coming now. God's Word is teaching you to talk to Him based on what you see in the Scripture. And the third thing is I'm asking, right? Asking. I have a lot to ask for as I look at Scripture. I don't have a lot to do first. I have a lot to ask for help in. And that 20, 30 minutes gets up like quick. You know, I remember walking. I'm like, man, I wish I had more time. Now you get back to life. And that Word that you've been storing up will come out at times that you need it. He will bring to your remembrance everything that you've heard. All right? So that's, that's what you're going to do. So I want to ask you a question. Where in your life will you have time to do that? I'm not going to get the answer now, but Patty will handle that with the ladies. I'll handle it with the guys because that's very important that as you're reading the text, trusting God, that you're also taking 20 minutes or so. If not every day, at least every other day, that you're going for a walk. Maybe some of you exercise. You could do it while you exercise. Be careful not to bump into anything. But a lot of this you can do with your eyes open. Okay? I'm going to pray for us and we're going to take a break. And then, Patty, you're going to be with the ladies, right? And I will be with the guys. Okay? How many guys do we have? We have just a few. Okay. We'll do fine. All right. Um, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the word that teaches us to have faith. Father, help us to stick within our area of responsibility. Help us to discern what is love and what is our responsibility as we look at your word through this study. Help us out of trusting you to do good, knowing that good is coming, that you will be faithful and I thank you for those who are here, and I pray that you'll continue this as we go now to different group time. In Christ's name, amen. So there's snacks. You can take a little break, and we'll come back, okay? I'm looking and I'm thinking I better not. I better let you stick around here. It's a good
Give me mine wine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and he has your um, email. He has our email address and everything. Okay. Okay. Let me grab. Um, yeah, we can get some chairs over here. Over, over in this way. Yep. And trying to get to the um, camera. So for those of you who are online, um, we want to um, ask if you guys could, um, trying to get in the camera, if you guys could uh, send an email to both Tim and myself, and you'll be able to see our emails on the, the, the chat. Um, and let us know how we can be praying for you um, this week as far as what adversity you might be going through. Um, we also would like for you in that email to let us know how you're planning to do your um, meditation and worship walks. So um, please just look at your week and plan out what days and what times you're going to um, bring those in um, to your to your weekly routine. Um, and then next week, we have another counselor who's going to be able to help us with the breakout sessions. And Tim himself is going to interact with the, uh, those of you who are online so you guys can work through and chat about your week and go through some of the material together. Um, also, um, you should have gotten an email from me um, earlier today. If you did not, please let me know so I can email you information about um, our Google Docs um, folder that we're going to be putting in all of our handouts so that um, just like tonight what Tim went through with the handouts, we have that online for you that you can download and follow along with us. Um, on that is a schedule and it tells you each, each week what we will be covering as far as the Trusting God book because we are also going to be reading and doing the study, study guide. Um, so please be um, looking for that as well. If you have any questions, please send me an email um, and you should see that on uh, the online chat. And that's patty with a Y at lcbcc.org. Um, so for tonight, we're just going to ask you um, that you're dismissed and we'll hope to see you next week. Um, and thanks again so much for tuning in. And so that's it. So you should be able to... Um, so we've got that there. Do you want to go ahead and close the session now? Yeah, and if they have the... Um, also, you can, can you type in our... Yeah, you have our email addresses. Yeah, you put the shareable link in the email address. Yep, then you should be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close off? Yep. Okay.